Predicting the next big one is not easy, nor is such a practice currently reliable. However, thanks in large measure to seismologists who first theorized primary secondary surface waves in the early 1800s, identifying places where earthquakes will occur is indeed reliable. Just as early leaders in the Weather Service argued that in the 1880s the science behind predicting tornadoes was inadequate and would unnerve citizens, the same can be said for making predictions about when a major earthquake will occur. As a young aspiring geoscientist, I can personally attest the visceral reaction some people may have to the fear of an earthquake. In 1989, I was a graduate student immersed in the geosciences at Western Kentucky University. That fine institution is located about 60 miles north of Nashville, Tennessee in Bowling Green, Kentucky, which is situated in an area that since 1985 had been predicted to experience widespread damage from an imminent earthquake. Well. The epicenter of this anticipated quake would be along the Mississippi River in the same location as the big ones that occurred there in 1811 and 12. I did a video on those quakes, which history calls the New Madrid Earthquakes. Now, while my reaction was not a major event in and of itself, the fact that I and other graduate students were assigned the task of mapping caves in the earthquake damage zone led to a situation that affected the mapping of a portion of the regional landscape, albeit on a minor scale. Professor Nick Crawford, the university's well-regarded hydrologist, asked Mike Brent, John Wilson, and I to use a topographic map to locate and map a series of caves in Simpson County, Kentucky that, that Crawford had theorized were connected to the larger Mammoth Cave system. In exchange for our work in being the first persons to map these caves, we were allowed to name portions of them. Armed with a host of mapping tools, we entered Wilson's cave on a cold December night. It was about nine below zero that night, as I recall. As we descended into the bowels of Simpson County, we encountered a shallow pass that connected two larger rooms. I was the second of the group of three to crawl through the 30 to 40 foot section. The ceiling of this corridor was only about 20 inches above its floor. When I was about halfway through, thoughts of the recent earthquake predictions suddenly took over my mind. In my imagined world of the New Madrid earthquake, I watched the wave emanate from the epicenter along the Mississippi River. Then I imagined waves of energy passing through limestone rocks and I quickly perceived myself to be sandwiched and, and indeed trapped. Within seconds, I envisioned the ceiling above me collapse, leaving 225 pounds of gooey stain between two layers of Simpson County limestone. The stain, of course, was me. Now, my reaction was perhaps one of the most extreme panic attacks my friends had ever witnessed. With their help, I calmed down and we finished our assignment. Once back on campus, we sat down to name rooms and portions of Wilson's Cave. Those names were to appear on the maps we had drawn for the Center for Cave and Car Studies. My colleagues decided that the shallow, narrow pass that prompted me to imagine my demise would henceforth be known as Panic Pass. It's been over 33 years since we mapped Wilson's Cave, and thankfully another big one has not visited the region. Nevertheless, this situation shows the visceral reaction some of us can have when we surrender to the fear of an earthquake. The lack of precision in making predictions can invite unnecessary or unfounded worry. With that said, however, there's been a continuance of minor tremors in the New Madrid zone. The fact that the region was visited by big ones in the past makes it necessary for structures to be engineered with earthquakes in mind. While predicting the next big one with current seismographic instruments has limited value, current technology can show the location of quake epicenters. Knowing the geography of earthquakes allows rescue teams <clears throat> to be quickly sent out to areas that were hit the hardest. It also lets us know where the next big one might occur. The ability to map earthquakes has evolved a great deal since the early 1800s when Augustin Cauchy and Simeon Poisson and others began the process with their work on elastic cave propagation in the early 1800s. The person who coined the term seismology and epicenter was an Irish engineer named Robert Mallet who lived around 1810 to 1881. In 1849, he and his son John, who at the time was a geology student at Trenton Col Trinity College, Dublin, not Trenton College, but Trinity College, Dublin, conducted a series of experiments on the east coast of Ireland to determine if waves of energy emanating from an epicenter could travel through sand. 
Detonating dynamite buried in the sand, the father and son team used a seismoscope to detect waves of energy a half mile away from the explosive epicenter. In 1857, a large earthquake struck southern Italy, and with the help of Charles Darwin and English geologist Charles Lyell, Mallet received a grant from the Royal Society of London to travel to Italy so he could study the damage area. His field trip enabled him to draw maps illustrating the contours of damage. Now, Mallet's research and maps suggested that energy from Earth, it also showed that locating the epicenter of an earthquake is possible by tracing damage waves backward toward the source. Mallet was convinced that widely established monitoring stations would yield important data that would help build earthquake science. Later that year, Mallet and his son drew one of the first seismographic maps of the world. It should not come as a surprise that the next advances in the development of seismographs would occur in societies that had the most to gain from innovations and refinements in the fledgling science. Filippo Sesci, a physicist from Tuscany, Italy, was barely 35 years old when the quake of 1857 struck his native Italy. Being a man of many talents and interests, Sesci was also keenly interested in meteorology and in 1885, he was elected vice president of the newly formed Italian Meteorological Society. Whereas in the United States, there's a clear professional line between meteorology and seismology, Italy had no such distinction in the late 1800s. Sesci directed an observatory in Florence from 1872 to 1887. He helped establish other meteorological stations in Tuscany. Using his own funds, Sesci set up an endowment for his Florentine Meteorological Observatory to operate a seismological center. Although Sesci invented various types of seismographs, he's perhaps best known for the one he designed and built in 1875. While his instrument was reliable in uh, measuring waves in the early stages of an earthquake, its accuracy diminished after the first few cycles of shaking. The Sesci seismograph was put to good use in other countries, though. Until 1897, seismometers, including the Sesci device, were limited in their ability to chart successive waves of energy produced by an earthquake. That changed when Emil Wischert, or Wischert a Prussian a geophysics specialist, developed a widely used seismometer that was able to record the entire duration of a quake. In that same year, a version of a seismometer was installed at the Lick Observatory near San Jose, California. This was fortuitous because the instrument was still in use when the San Francisco earthquake occurred in 1906. The Wischert or Weichert seismometer recorded valuable information about that devastating event. An American engineer named Harry F. Reed, not the senator, but a geoscientist, studied survey lines across the San Andreas Fault before and after the San Francisco quake and developed an elastic rebound theory which proposed that accumulated elastic energy was built up along the fault. The quake occurred when the energy was released and subsequent research has confirmed that the rebound theory is the primary cause of tectonic earthquakes. The Weichert device, however, was not the last major step forward in monitoring earthquakes. The first of the electromagnetic seismometers, which are still used today, was developed in Russia by Boris B. Galatsin and were installed in several countries after World War I. While detecting and measuring earthquakes has enabled seismologists to identify places where the next big one will likely occur, it's difficult to know how much stress is required to trigger it. One fact is certain though, earthquakes originate in fault zones, those are cracks in the Earth's crust. It follows that places that have been visited by tremors and massive quakes in the past are likely to experience them again. Unlike a broken femur or tibia, fractures in the lithosphere do not heal. As described by Reed in his rebound theory, tectonic forces that build stress between plates do not disappear when the tension is released in a quake. Due to seafloor spreading, the lithosphere persistently reloads forces that cause tectonic activity, including earthquakes. While past experiences with quakes are important in constructing probability models to predict the next big one, being able to measure plate stresses and how much pressure is needed to trigger an event remain elusive challenges. Societies located along the Pacific Rim, the area of the Earth that is perhaps most likely to experience strong to great earthquakes, are cognizant of their situations. 
In recent years, building designs have been implemented that enable structures to absorb most of the shock generated by tectonic activity. Still, a great quake will be difficult to withstand. Settlements located on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea are vulnerable because many buildings are old and brittle, kind of like me. Fortunately for these areas, earthquakes are less frequent, but they can and will occur again. Given the high population densities of Greece and Italy, the death toll could be high. As an area of active volcanism, those societies also face a second dangerous scenario from plate tectonics, of course, earthquakes. It's not pleasant to imagine the devastation and loss of life that will occur in the Mediterranean Basin if it experiences eruptions and shaking like those that occurred on Santorini in 1500 BC and at Mount Vesuvius in AD 79. Of course, those were volcanic activities, but they are also tied to, to plate tectonics. I would be remiss if I did not call attention to the new magnet fault zone. If another series of quakes in the same magnitude as those that visited the region in 1811-1812 occurs, death and property destruction would be catastrophic. Thanks for joining me today. Until I see you again, God bless you and yours. Bye-bye.